Well, thank you, uh, Joyce, for that kind introduction. And uh, it's great to be here today, and it's great to be in Dublin. We've had a, a very, very warm welcome from everyone in Dublin. And I've got to say how impressed I are by your tech sector here. I think I was last here a couple of years after the financial crisis that I know was a tough time for Ireland. But um, it's just amazingly, I know it's been a tough time, but how quickly, perhaps quickly isn't the right word, but you've bounced back and the, your technology sector is so impressive. And I think one of the other things that's impressed me this week is how well um, your um, industry or business community works with the academic sector in Ireland to develop course content to promote you know, the skills and capability sets that you want to grow your industry. So um, congratulations on all you've achieved. So as Joy said, the topic of my discussion today is really to uh, promote international standards one, and why I think they're important um, for the application and use of blockchain uh, across the globe. I'll touch a bit on what blockchain is and more about why uh, I see it as being a significant technology and as Joyce said, talk about the pathway to international standards and again, why those international standards are significant in terms of promoting greater investment, greater innovation in blockchain and also present some economic studies which show how uh, international standards in technology actually improve the efficiency of innovation. So I'll get straight into it. And I Sorry, that's probably a bit small for everyone to see. I apologise. We can make these slides available afterwards. But this is really just touching on um, some of the work, investment and companies and governments that are involved in blockchain around the world. And the point of the slide is just to demonstrate how significant it is. And this is investment and activity that's happened really over the, the last couple of years. And typically what you see with new technologies is they sort of start at the edge of ecosystems and then they begin to emerge into the mainstream. And that's what you're seeing with blockchain over the last couple of years. And interestingly, not only are you seeing significant investment and interest from large, um, well, pretty well every large uh, company in the world, but also the large tech companies. And interestingly, uh, or as equally as important, you're seeing strong interest from governments, central banks. Uh, the World Bank, in fact, issued one of its bonds using um, blockchain technology. The Australian Stock Exchange is going to use blockchain technology for its uh, next uh, technological system. Uh, and a lot of central banks are looking at it from a cryptocurrency perspective. And many of you that aren't uh, sort of close to the technology, you've probably heard most about blockchain through cryptocurrencies. And it's an important part of the technology, but only one very small part of what blockchain uh, can do for the world. And this next chart really talks about uh, that second point about the significance of the technology for the world going forward. And of course, uh, like any new technology, there are sceptics and people who don't believe that it is going to be significant as I do. But I think it does have um, some fundamental consequences for how we work um, around the world in business and more broadly, including in government. And one of the most significant things is really this capacity to create truly a unique digital assets or identities, which can't be double spent or can't be counterfeited. So you're effectively creating um, uh, intuitive digital assets, if you like or native digital assets. And that's uh, leading to a so whole series of opportunities. You may have heard about the token economy, ICOs, completely new business models, new, t new types of money, which I'll come back to later, and also new forms of trust. And one of the most significant aspects, potentially, of blockchain is that you can develop trusted approaches to business and government without the reliance on a central intermediary. And for a lot of people in the world, that provides an opportunity to democratise certain things that today are really the sole, um, in the sole control of central institutions or large corporates. So I've used that quote at the top of the chart, which you may or may not be able to read from an author uh, in blockchain. And if you get a chance, he's written a great book, co-authored a great book called The Truth Machine, um, which is a really nice way of understanding the technology and the possible consequences that blockchain can deliver. But I've, I've lifted from that quote about the importance or um, how important data is to the world economy going forward. And I suppose many, many corporations quite naturally look to control or monetize that data. And what blockchain potentially allows is the democratization of that data. It allows an individual potentially to take back control, ownership, and monetization of the data on them. And that has resulted in many people who talk about the application or the use of technology talk about it almost as um, passionately 
in terms of the social implications it can have for how the world operates rather than simply as a pure technology. And as you'd expect in a, in a technology and uh, communities within the technology around blockchain that see the opportunity to decentralise and to create forms of trust without a central, in, central sort of intermediary or institution, there's a lot of passion for that approach. And it means um, that a lot of people wonder whether international standards make sense or not. And interestingly, Michael Casey, this same author, makes the point that even in that sort of world where we're looking to avoid censorship and to counter sort of strict control with a central authority, that there's still a need for standards. And in fact, one of the biggest investors in this space, Joel Monogro, who's uh, written a sort of a preeminent blog on um, the technology, um, he would argue or he would say that he looks for investment in blockchain in communities that are well governed and have standards. So uh, even though it's sort of a, a very uh, decentralised and a u unique community, uh, people recognise the importance of have some, having some sort of set, um, over, overriding governance or standards. When you think about standards, uh, they tend to become uh, formed or developed in three typical ways. Uh, through regulation, through consensus, so like ISO, where you have an international community coming together to develop international standards through consensus. And you also have de facto standards. And de facto standards tend to get created often by uh, when a corporation or business might, um, with a leading position in a technology or a protocol or a product, that technology or position becomes so dominant, um, their approach to that technology almost becomes a de facto standard. And they're the sort of ways standards tend to come together. And it, in, in some sense, you'll have um, very good standards come together under either of those uh, means of development and also some not so good standards. There's often a debate about you know, technology because it's evolving so quickly. Uh, let the market decide, if you like, why would you have international standards and do they actually benefit technology? And as I said, there has been uh, some academic research into this topic and it does demonstrate that there are real benefits in having standards in technology. And so um, examples for the benefits, and I won't go through all of them, but they allow for the design and development of modular systems and therefore you get specialisation, you get greater scale and you get innovation in componentry in the modular breakup of technologies. It also avoids a, a, a asymmetric switching costs and that means where you invest in a particular technology and because there are no standard, it sort of limits your future choices about future technologies you might invest in going forward. And it also leads to the greater efficiency um, in innovation going forward. So there are clear benefits and I thought I just, um, as Joyce said, one of my other roles is a non-executive director of the largest telecommunications company in Australia and telecommunications very different technologies, but um, you'll probably be aware that international standards in that space are pretty critical. I mean, from the even more obvious, there'll be some in the room that are older enough to remember 2G. Um, we're now coming up to 5G, but it, when there was the world of 2G, you, and if you were an international traveller, there were some countries where you had to buy a different phone in that country for it to work. Now, that's an obvious advantage of having a common standard across the world, but the benefits of international uh, standards in 3G, 4G and the soon to be 5G are really significant. And they're significant because they allow for much more investment. And when you think about if you're rolling out a global telco network, we're talking about billions and billions of dollars. So you want some surety that the technology you're rolling out meets certain standards and also can be have interoperability around the world. If you have international standards, it also means, assuming that there are no, no global barriers to uh, trade, that you can pick amongst the best in the world where that technology is developed because you, knew, you know you can apply that technology to your network. So uh, apart from the obvious thing, we can use the same phone wherever we go around the world, there's huge benefits in terms of the efficiency of investment and the efficiency of innovation that comes from standards in technology and that's a, a good example is telco. One of the challenges that you have in the development of any technology standards and blockchain is this is especially true because blockchain is still an emerging technology. As you saw from an earlier slide, there's a lot of money, a lot of investment, a lot of interest going into it, but it's still an emerging, it's still a developing, it's not a mature technology. And so the question arises is, when do you apply standards? Because if you go too early, do you apply a standard on a technology that's immature, 
that, that can be improved. Um, so how do you get that balance right? And some would also argue it's better let for the market to work. Let the market to decide which is the preferred standard or the preferred standard for a technology by consumers or businesses or governments voting the, for their feet for that uh, technology that applies a particular standard. Um, so there are differences of views on international standards. Um, but the danger is if you don't move soon enough, the danger is you do get de facto standards arise from the market. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing because many of them have proven to be effective, but they're not always. And this is an example I really love around speed versus quality. And it goes back to um, an ancient technology called the typewriter, which again, some of us in the room will have remembered using. Not you, Joyce, you're too young. But um, I remember doing uh, typing, schools at, uh, typing skills at school. Um, and it's interestingly that the, the configuration of the typewriter and configuration of the keyboard that we all use today um, was actually invented by a manufacturer to slow down typing. Because the technology of the day meant if you type too quickly, uh, the keys of the typewriter used to jam. And manufacturers used to have different setups. So if you're a typist, depending on the typewriter, it was very difficult to type because they, the key configuration was different. This one company brought out this configuration. It slowed typists down, which meant they didn't jam, and therefore it became the leading technology. Now, you might say that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But um, then later uh, in time, in the, in the 1930s, uh, the standards body in the US said, well, this is mad. This configuration is really slow. Let's invent a new one, because type, typing, uh, typewriters had improved and the keys didn't jam. Of course, it didn't, it didn't take effect because everyone was so used to using the existing keypad. It's a simple example, but it demonstrates how standards, whether they're created by international bodies or through de facto leadership, don't always lead to the best outcome. And it's a judgment around when you apply those standards and the approach you take. When you think about blockchain, as I said, and I won't go through this in detail because it's quite technical, but there are still a range of challenges or limitations for the technology. It's not a mature technology, it's an emerging developing technology, and the technologists in the room like Terry and others would know um, that's the case with most technologies, and therefore there are limitations or challenges. One of the advantages of international standards is we can help deal with those challenges or limitations, and through that encourage greater investment, create greater innovation to cut through some of these challenges. So, there is a very strong case, in my view, for international standards. I know I'm probably coming to time, so I'll be quick, Joyce. Um, so what we've done internationally is create a technical committee under uh, ISO to develop standards for blockchain and distributed ledgers. And uh, I won't go through the detail, but really the objective of that committee is to get international agreed ways of working, standardisation, if you like, that allow for improvements in security, privacy, scalability, and perhaps the holy grail in a lot of technologies, the interoperability of the technology across a range of different blockchains and like. And that will then lead to its greater adoption, greater efficiencies, greater innovation, and the better outcome of the application of that technology for the benefit of everyone around the world. So there's a whole range of areas um, that we're working on. And importantly, it's an area that's very well supported. So I think we started in Sydney in our first meeting in April 2017 with sort of 17 founding members, if you like. One of those was Ireland, which is great. Um, and we also have external liaisons. One of those from the get-go was the European Commission, have been great supporters of the development of these standards. But I just use that chart to demonstrate there's a lot of interest in this space and it goes right across the globe. I won't go through these next charts, partly because you can't see them, <laughs> and also they're very detailed, but they just, they're just going through the areas of work uh, and uh, the focus points in terms of developing standards uh, for the technology. So I'll just leave you with this uh, final quote that just reinforces the benefit of international standards and, and why they're so important in terms of spurring innovation and investment in a technology. And I just do want to make a case for international standards. Most technologies today affect the whole globe, particularly if they become significant. Um, so their, their digital world is not something that individual countries can ignore and we sort of have to partner on for them to be effective. You've seen that in the telco standards. The great thing about ISO is they're developed through consensus. It's the, the international community coming together. We're trying to get the best experts around the world, the users of the technology, the developers of the technology to come together and create the standards. International consensus 
means that a standard is more likely to be effective if the whole world's been involved in the development of the standard. It also means they take time because international consensus is much easier to say than deliver. But the value of getting it, once you get it, is the whole world gets behind it and it has real impact. So I'll finish up with that. Um, it's a powerful new technology. It's still emerging, it's still developing, but this technology, like some other technologies in the past, has the, has the capability to fundamentally change the world and how we work, how we govern, how we work as businesses, how we operate as individuals. And it's important, given the potential significance of that technology, that we have standards that are supported by an international community to make it happen in the best way possible. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much, Craig, for that really powerful presentation. It's a complicated area, but I think you managed to do it so clearly for us, which was great and with great passion and, um, and even, uh, even under time. So it was quite <laughs> amazing. I th the, the point you made, I think, about partnership and the importance of working with the EU, uh, we're very cognizant here. And we're very pleased to have Emilio de Villa Gonzalez here with us. He is head of ICT standardization, digital innovation and blockchain unit in DG Connect. Uh, in the European Commission. He's responsible for the coordinating of ICT standardization strategies with a particular focus on the interplay between standardization research and innovation. Emilio has been a uh, director of the Spanish Association of New Technologies and also has worked in other areas of the Commission, in particular intelligent transport systems. And today, uh, Emilio is going to look with us at the blockchain EU strategy and key objectives. And I think this is really going to be important, a key. It links in very much with what Craig was saying, the international side, to see what Europe is doing now and what vision it has for making blockchain applicable in all kinds of situations. So thank you very much, Emilio. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I really like to, to be in Dublin. I feel like at home in Spain, we, we share a lot of <laughs> things. Then I'm in the, in the house of Europe, so again, <laughs> I feel like at home. And the weather is like in Brussels. So <laughs> I'm not going to, to talk so much about the standard because, I mean, Craig made already the brilliant uh, introduction about uh, the standardization goal and what they are. And he's really... Uh, an expert on that, but rather on, on why the European Union uh, has uh, taken a position to, to really promote uh, the use of uh, blockchain and to promote a, a European vision there, and uh, how we are structuring the, the work of both uh, the policy side and bringing all stakeholders together to, because we would like uh, that the uh, European Union, it is clear that blockchain uh, is a, a hot issue, an important issue in the international sphere, so we like the European Union to be at the front, the front of this uh, development. And uh, why are we taking this um, so much serious? And in particular, I'm working in the unit uh, that is uh, following the blockchain uh, in the Commission. At the very beginning, it was uh, started to be followed by the, the financial uh, directory general. Uh, and now we are doing it in Connect because we have seen that uh, it has a, a high potential, not only in the financial technology uh, sector, like uh, Craig has explained, but also in uh, many others, uh, including public services. So you can have it in health, uh, energy management, uh, all identity uh, trusted uh, applications. It has clearly a, a cross-border uh, effect, so this is important for Europe, being able, for instance, to have an electronic identification and trustable uh, identification all around Europe, this is important for us. It has a clear value for citizens, think about all the health, uh, notaries, uh, uh, tax, uh, financial technologies. There is an incredible, vibrant uh, ecosystem, including the startups, and we have seen it from uh, many different research projects in, in uh, Connect, uh, we are funding the research project in the ICT domain. And we, before having a specific topic on blockchain, there were already many sectors projects dealing with uh, uh, blockchain applications. And uh, uh, on top of it, we need to develop in order to make it progress also on a regulatory framework within the European Union. 
the European Union, you know very well, we have uh, these uh, 28 for the moment member states. And uh, we need really uh, services that can be provided to the citizens uh, cross-border. So for that reason also, we care a lot about the standards that can promote interoperability. So what is our strategy? And again, it's a combination of, uh, on one side, uh, uh, setting up a, a policy vision and uh, a political vision, so together with the European institutions, uh, the European Parliament and the European Council with uh, our member states, but also trying to promote uh, the cooperation with uh, all the stakeholders that should be involved uh, in, the, in the value change, so from industry, academia, startups, uh, and also citizens, consumers. So to bring all together, and, and something that could also be very useful in our opinion to provide for a standardization, because you already create some pre-consensus that then could be brought into a standards uh, arena. And then um, we care not only about European perspective. I fully agree with uh, what has been said. That this is a global issue. It's the same that uh, with uh, global telephony. And we saw the importance of having uh, global solutions. Um, and uh, the, it doesn't stop uh, blockchain services in the, in the European borders. We're thinking of that. So we want to have uh, this connection with, uh, with the global areas. We are. You have said uh, supporting the, the, the work of the TC307 since the very beginning, because we believe that uh, there should be global solutions. Of course, that uh, will take into account the European requirements, for instance, GDPR, the data protection, or uh, the electronic identification that uh, we are promoting there. This should be brought into the, the standard requirements, but we really value to have uh, global uh, standards that will also help uh, the European industries uh, to go and uh, develop solutions for other regions in the world. We will continue investing on uh, research, innovation, and, and startups. So we have different funds for that, in particular the, the, the different frameworks program for research and innovation. And uh, now we are uh, just opening uh, now in, in fall a new call for proposals, specifically devoted to, to blockchain. And we will continue with more uh, uh, funding um, and also to, to develop the infrastructure in the in the next framework program Horizon uh, Europe, and then the legal framework. Uh, and you mentioned that already that there are legal issues there that ha has been uh, need to to get some research how to find solution and then how to promote a legal uh, framework that could work for everybody within the EU and, and even uh, beyond interoperable standards again. In Europe, we really need it. <laughs> we cannot have a system that works uh, in Ireland and uh, doesn't work in France uh, when you cross the border. Yeah. And then uh, skills. We are also trying to support um, the development of uh, digital skills and including in blockchain. So we are very glad to see that uh, you were announcing this morning a, a master on skills. We believe that, that this is really important to uh, promote uh, the, the appearance of uh, blockchain uh, and other digital solutions in Europe. So, all these activities. The first one, European Blockchain Observatory and Forum. This is uh, related to, to stakeholders uh, management. This is a, a common action we launched with the European Parliament. And it was uh, to bring uh, all the community and to try to uh, uh, understand what was already going on, what are the challenges, the challenges uh, you may know, and uh, what are the possible uh, solutions and identify where you need uh, more investment on resources. So on one side is an observatory to, to, to gather, uh, gather information and uh, research what's going on, but also a forum to bring uh, people together. And they have already produced uh, many, many valuable uh, deliverables and it brought uh, attention worldwide because we are talking about the standards, for instance, that the report on scalability, interoperability, and sustainability of blockchain. It is, uh, we were discussing the other day in, <laughs> in ISO, because it, it provides uh, issues related to okay, how to develop a possible scalable system, and that, uh, that we need some standardization activities and interoperability. What is missing? What are the gaps? Uh, what do we need to do? And, uh, but there are others like uh, what is the relation between uh, blockchain and, uh, and GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and uh, how to uh, use it for uh, government and public services. And they also develop workshops, uh, and um, this has been very useful, and honestly, I attended a couple of them, and uh, you see people really committed and exchanging views, uh, and you see there the, 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 the number of workshops and more that will be organized. The last one was last Friday in Brussels on, on digital assets, 
so this could uh, feed and all these uh, all these uh, activities and results are available and uh, we would really like uh, the global community to take into account and to get advantage of uh, and these uh, results then on the other side we have the policy engagement and this was important uh, again because if we have one solution that works in one member state and then the other member state goes in another direction then we are back <laughs> with some issues then better to have uh, a full European blockchain uh, strategy. So this is really to mobilize uh, uh, our member states, our public, uh, our policy makers. And then uh, we, we promote the European blockchain partnerships with a declaration on uh, the 10th of April 2018. And now it has been um, joined uh, by all our member states, uh, with the exception of Croatia, I think, but uh, they, they, they have already applied to do that plus some from the uh, EA area. And here is uh, on one side to, to develop a common strategy, a common political vision, and on the other side uh, also to make a cooperation to establish this European blockchain services infrastructure. So to build uh, the, the foundations for having uh, public uh, blockchain uh, trusted uh, services uh, using this uh, infrastructure. And they are aiming really at concrete uh, deliverables that uh, you have here so developing uh, the use cases for these uh, cross-border digital public services identifying what could be the priority ones or where to start then uh, think about the possible functionality and the architecture to 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 develop uh, these uh, services uh, and then uh, to set up a governance model so here again you see a lot of uh, uh, interaction with the standardization because they need to have an architect they need to develop technical specification in which to be based the, the European block uh, chain service infrastructure and it is organized with two groups the policy group which are defining the political ideas and the technical group which is looking to the different uh, use cases and uh, trying to promote the, the, the architect it's working quite well, so we were surprised because sometimes we really need to chase our member states to join initiative, but in this case it was the other way around and they were knocking at the door. So you see that there is a real interest in Europe for uh, blockchain, and now we have these uh, 29 members, so including Norway and uh, Liechtenstein from the uh, European uh, uh, Economic Space Area. And then there was already been disagreement with the orientation in three deliverables, and the, the group is working well to have the so we have an initial set of uh, use cases which are in the public area like notarization, uh, how to exchange uh, diplomas, uh, then um, develop an European sovereign identity framework or in the taxation areas. There may be new ones uh, coming on and they are looking also at uh, what will be the principle, the architecture and there. And there, again, we need to have these uh, interactions with the standardizations on one side to bring uh, the results of uh, this uh, activities to the standard arena and uh, this is something we are trying to do and see for instance that use cases are, they are contemplated to, to, to get feedback and to use the standards that are already there and then we will also use the connecting european facility this is uh, some funding we have um, in relation to the, the the framework program for research but for implementation so here it will be used and there is budget allocated to develop the the this european digital uh, service blockchain infrastructure so it's working well we have also not only from the member states but also from the european parliament in the european parliament they are really motivated to the to the blockchain and they organize some workshops they get the 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 blockchain observatory was at the beginning of the Horizon 2020, we had not a line on blockchain, but uh, they put at our disposal some funding they have to make the, the observatory. And then uh, clearly they, they made a resolution supporting the, to make uh, the European Union a leading player in blockchain technology and also supporting the activities that uh, we are doing in the European Commission. We hope that the new European Parliament that has recently been selected, and I saw still the, the candidates uh, all around Dublin, <laughs> so we'll continue with um, this support. So here you have uh, that they call uh, the commission to propose this regulatory approach and to continue with the, the, these activities. And not only that, the most important in this multi-annual uh, financial framework, they accepted to have funding for the below both the infrastructure and provide more funding to, to research uh, activities. But now we, we, we went uh, 
a step beyond, and it was uh, to promote the creation of uh, the INADBA, the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. And I think the Commission, we are good to, to bring stakeholders together. We are very bad in developing acronyms, and <laughs> because this one is there. But uh, the idea is, because uh, we need all this consensus and we need these uh, common uh, solutions, is uh, to bring all together. And this is not uh, Europe. It has been funded in Europe. We launched it in, in, in Brussels in, in April. But uh, it has a, a, a global scope. So uh, we're really, uh, there are already some uh, partners from Japan, uh, from India, I think from Australia, there are also some members there. And we would like uh, them to, to join the, the, this in ADBA. Uh, and the idea is really to create a multi-stakeholder forum, bringing in industry uh, academy to promote uh, all what is needed to develop uh, this uh, blockchain, uh, uh, not only European, but globally. So promoting interoperability, transparent governance, uh, legal certainty and trust. And then you see that there are these different working groups that, that are looking at different areas. So interoperability, specification, they will most likely create a working group on standardizations, for instance, and there we need also to ensure that there is a, a, a liaison with all the different standardization organizations, but also to have these regulatory dialogues, because uh, there are many, many of the, the, the applications that uh, will be um, fostered because they are beneficial for the citizens by the government, so this is a, a place where industry service providers can meet um, regulators in order to find common solution. So it's also, uh, there is a lot of momentum there and it's uh, progressing well. And uh, again, we encourage all the partners to join in ADVA because then this is where important discussions may take place. Legal framework, this is also amazing. We are looking at the legal framework with the different partnerships and also internally in the commission and things like uh, smart contracts, which the impact of a smart contract, which is the, the legal uh, validity that it has which will be things like uh, which jurisdiction, where was uh, the, legal, the, the, the smart contract there. So there are things that possibly need to be updated in, in the international law as well. Uh, and these are things that uh, are being looked at, or, again, the, the legal framework for tokenization. So you see that there are different bodies looking at that. On one side, the working group legal from the blockchain observatory. In advice, looking as well uh, to something is there. And we have the opinion, of, for instance, of the European banking authorities uh, there. And we are launching a study looking with more detail into all these areas. Important thing, and uh, you can uh, get the date, we are also in ADVA and supported by, by us, by the European Commission, we are launching the, the, this World Blockchain Conference. We wanted to have a World Blockchain Congress, but it was already copyrighted by somebody. <laughs> so it's a conference, but the idea, again, is uh, bringing it all together with the different strands for three days in Malaga in November. There, the, the weather is nice even in November. So <laughs> it's a nice place to be, and we really want to bring all the constituency and discuss about uh, what's going on, but mainly with a prospective view what do we need to go and how do we need to cooperate uh, in order to promote all the blockchain uh, services and applications. Way forward. So with all the actions, we will continue, of course, uh, funding uh, research and innovation uh, and there are through existing new programs. And here we ask when uh, we have some of these topics, we ask uh, the projects also to contribute to standardization globally. This is important. We know and if you are there attending uh, the TC307, you see how many different working groups are there in parallel, how many resources you need to invest. Uh, so we try to push our projects to bring the results in standardization. And uh, we will continue funding it. And again, there is a, a, an open call for proposals. So if anybody is interested, it will be announced in October. We have a, a proposals there in Helsinki, and then uh, normally it will close in December. But be aware of that uh, if you want to apply for it. <coughs> We will continue to address these regulatory aspects, and we are really looking forward to the results of, of the study and how then uh, this can be brought into the digital single market. Then uh, we need to build uh, with this connected Europe facility the, the European blockchain service infrastructure for public uh, with uh, pilots and practical cross-border use cases. Uh, and this will be important also because it will be able to test uh, the, the standards that have been developed, the architecture, and also provide feedback then to standardization bodies what else needs to be done, and then generate uh, cross-border services for the citizens. Then promote this public-private cooperation, and again, I encourage everybody to, to come here. Engage in international outreach, 
through Inalba, but also here, and uh, that's why we are participating. And we are also having blockchain in our dialogues with other regions of, uh, of the world, like United States, Japan, Korea, etc. Working in standardization, and uh, again, uh, my colleague was uh, since the very beginning of the TC307, but we are also following all the other standardization activities. In Etsy, they have an industry specialist group um, dealing with uh, permission uh, uh, blockchain. And uh, in ITUT, there is another focus group. And something that is important there also is uh, that uh, I think uh, because the resources are what they are, that all the different standardization organizations work uh, together and cooperate and exchange information. So we don't go into different standards that could be a disaster, to be honest, but rather uh, every expert uh, group goes in its field of expertise and then they try to, to maximize the, the synergies between there. We have for that uh, in Europe created a multi-stakeholder platform on ICT standardization where we bring together all the different standards organizations active in ICT and uh, we will pass this message uh, there as well uh, in the message. And we need a real interoperability. So we will continue pushing for that. And then we are also preparing some investment fund uh, together with the European Bank of, uh, for Investment uh, with this new um, multifinancial framework uh, that could help uh, to mobilize venture capitalists uh, to support uh, both artificial intelligence and blockchain. So how we can't uh, implement projects in these two areas. And the last one, related to the master, we will continue promoting digital skills and education. So again, uh, in Europe, just uh, to, to summarize, uh, we really believe that blockchain uh, is uh, it's not the future, it's the present, but we need really to make it uh, to get as much advantage as possible. We believe uh, it's an important policy initiative and we are trying to do it uh, from uh, the European Union and in collaboration with all the policy makers. And uh, we will continue supporting the investment in research, in infrastructure, and also we believe that international standardization is important and we will continue there. For that, uh, we have developed all these uh, tools because in the European Union, we don't have a, a magic wand uh, in our offices to, to decide what is there, but we rather believe in the cooperation with the different stakeholders. So here you have all the, all the different addresses and uh, we really encourage you to, to join uh, in APA to look at the, what is being published in the observatory, be involved in the activities in the workshop. I mean, if you have a, a, any doubt there, we are there also. You can contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you.